I like to get outside and learn about uh, what's happening around me. And despite a lot of summers up in Alaska, once I had kids, I spent a lot of time here in the summer um, looking around me. And what's amazing, I think, is when you get old, like me, you really do see changes that have happened. And it's important to uh, try to understand what we're seeing. So I want to show you about the marshes that I've looked at for a couple of decades up and down the river, starting with Jamaica Bay. And um, I've taken a lot of kids out. This is the 20th year. Actually, I've taught the wetlands and climate change class that started in 99. And it's pretty amazing to see what's happened just right around us. So you probably know how important wetlands are. Um, this, the uh, aquifer, of course, the Catskill Aquifer gives us the great water that we drink, so there's sponges. Not so many people know how important the marshes are for the babies of fish and the whole food chain. And this is one of the biggest um, concerns, I think, if we lose our marshes in the Hudson. Um, of course, it supports birds. We have protection of shorelines, which we saw in Sandy the effects of in Jamaica Bay. And then um, for us, of course, there are archives of environmental history. And only in the last 10 years or so have we realized how important they are for carbon, for carbon storage. And some of them in the, in the Hudson especially have incredibly high rates of sedimentation. So those are great carbon stores uh, moving forward. So the term blue carbon only came into existence, I think, probably five or six years ago. But it means the salt marshes, the tidal marshes, so freshwater, including um, freshwater marshes, mangroves, and sea grasses. But greater than 46%, so almost 50% of ocean sediment carbon is buried in those uh, blue carbon. And it's 50 times the rate what's stored in forests. So people talk about planting trees, but it's much more important to help a marsh get built or save a marsh. Um, but what's amazing, I think, and I've been in this area since the 70s, is to see the destruction of marshes despite all the protections that federal government has given. New York State has not been particularly great. Ellen could probably speak to this much, head, yes. much more than me, but um, the acreage, small marshes, small wetlands are not protected in New York State. They are in Connecticut, and it's interesting how state by state you have such a difference. Um, but just since the early 1800s, 25% globally have been destroyed, and we continue to destroy our marshes. Because if, if you think of all the terminology, that denigrates wetlands. I get bogged down, I'm swamped. You know, wetlands were the cheapest land for many years. So people dumped on them. There are incredible number of landfills on wetlands. And that, um, that is not a, a um, safe deposit for a lot of what's in the wetlands. And then there are 2,800 hectares in the Hudson Estuary and they're all at risk. And I'm gonna come back to some other work that other people have done in the Hudson Estuary. But first I'm gonna tell you about what they tell us. The, there's the organic part, and organic just means anything that was living, so plant and animal that's dead now in the marsh, and the inorganic, so that's the mineral matter, the sand, silt, and clay. And we had last week's talk by Mike so that you, um, Got, you have a different view from what's happening over in the Bangladesh, which is really nice to compare. Um, so what we set out to do was to see how these compositions change through time and how they were affected by climate and human impact. So I think when I started looking at this map, I was just amazed at how much marshland, this is Jamaica Bay, how many of you have ever been to Jamaica Bay other than Kennedy? Ellen and Vivian have worked there, but 
if you ever haven't, you know, it's a national park. So get out there and, and take a look. But what you can see from this 1888 survey map is all of this was wetland, including the island. And look at it today. So the whole thing is hardened. There are marshes left here that are disappearing, and we'll go into that at a pretty um, rapid rate. So one of the reasons, one of the things we looked at, well, how many streams were originally here bringing sediment? And there were 18. Now there are only eight. And those are pretty much hardened, meaning they don't bring much sediment in because they're, they're um, cement walls around them. And up from them is, you know, city. Um, the channels have also been deepened. The Coast Guard continues to deepen them. And it's not clear exactly if that's really needed, but it means that the uh, wave action is a lot higher than it used to be. And we wanted to see how much mineral sedimentation had slowed down because of the hardening of what has happened. We were trying to, Grant was here giving a talk, a student working with me, adding up the carbon. And we found this old reference that there used to be 6,000 hectares. Um, 4,500 were on the edge and only 1,500 in the island. And I'm not sure how that compares to um, what more recently people have said. But Ellen and Vivian worked on a paper in 2002 showing sort of the nonlinearity of the destruction of marshes with sea level rise. And they looked at aerial photos and satellite data. And you can see what happens is with sea level rise that you get ponding and um, accelerated erosion as sea level rises. Those channels widening? Yeah. Yes. So uh, we took two sites, Yalabar, the same one that they looked at there, and Joko. And Joko is a high marsh. It's the highest elevation, Joko and East Time Meadow, in the whole of Jamaica Bay. And we took what we, those of you who know me, is we look at paleoecology to understand past climate because the Vegetation gives us a signal as to how the climate is changing. So we look at pollen and spores. We look at macrofossils and charcoal, foraminifera. We can date the sediment with um, carbon-14 dating on single seeds, such as, well, this one's pretty tiny. but um, And then we look at loss on ignition to see how the organic matter is changing through time and the mineral supply. And then we look at nitrogen isotopes as well as carbon to tell us about how the estuary has been changing through time, as well as x-ray fluorescence, which there's a big machine at Lamont. And I'm going to show you some of the uh, results we got. Um, just in general, we use pollen because it's produced in great quantities. It's very resistant. And it, around New York, the Trees that indicate drought are really hickory, and I don't have the picture of hickory up here. Oak and hickory as opposed to pine. Drought is more pine and more hickory. And the wetter, moister species are oak and hemlock. And you know the woolly adelgid has attacked hemlock in this area. We also see disturbance pollen, so ragweed, rumex, and plantago. And um, those are often jumping up in the cracks in the sidewalk. But when the Europeans cut down trees, those are the species that uh, jump up. Now, we've dated shells, pre-bomb shells in the estuary, and they can date anywhere from 200 to 1,200 years ago. So you can't really believe dates on shells anywhere. Um, because they're animals, they're eating old carbon or young carbon. But the benefit of plant um, seeds is that they're taking their carbon from the air, so the dates are usually robust. People used to always date a bulk sample, which is a mixture of old and young, and we only date usually seeds. 
we also are going to use these um, signals like the ragweed to show when the Europeans came. We use the nitrogen to show increase in population and fertilizer. And then we use the heavy metals in our stratigraphy. And I think some of you have seen this. The, these are results from a paper in Jamaica Bay. The bottom line here is that um, the red is the inorganic, so the sand, silt, and clay. And in all the marshes, we see a big decline in that mineral component. Marshes need both to keep up with sea level rise. And when you cut off this supply or minimize it, the organic is staying the same in terms of um, this is the top meter of sediment, but the, you see this big drop in mineral this is roughly around 400 years ago. When the, was, oh, when the, you see it accelerate. This is the end of the 1800s. Yeah, so I'll show you. Um, well, at 50 centimeters, I think it's 1825, so actually here. This is the pollen record. You can see the oak decline with the European, um, the pines. They're cutting the pines as well. And the hickory. You can see there was a lot of hickory here that declines. And what comes up instead in the pollen, we count 300 pollen grains per sample to get our statistics, is that this is the ragweed rise. And interestingly, in the 20th century, we usually see ragweed decline. And that's because the trees have come back in this area in the 20th century. Here, and this is really interesting, I have to follow it, we see increases in grass which I think are, are producing more pollen because of the fertilizer, but I haven't confirmed that yet. We also look at the forams, and we haven't published this yet, but we can see the high marsh forams, trochamina and jadamina, and then as you go deeper in the core, this is now to two meters, you get the low marsh. Um, and uh, the Manhattan book that Eric Sanderson wrote he suggested that all the islands were there because of European impact and erosion coming out into <coughs> forming the marshes, as happened somewhere in Boston. But we see that the marshes were already there for probably at least a thousand years, maybe two thousand. We don't have good dates at the bottom. These are macrofossils of the high marsh, salt marsh grasses. So we've got those down to here when we change, we think, to low marsh. Um, okay, we've gone deeper. This is down now to four meters. And this is the percent loss on ignition. So what we do is we burn the samples and all the organics burn off. So when we first looked at these um, Loss on ignitions, we thought, oh, the marsh is getting more organic. But if you look at the actual weights, as I showed you before, again, you see that the inorganic is dropping off. And in this case, you see a decline starting back here at 88 centimeters. And that's in the early, um, uh, well, it's probably 1700. And this Joko core is a little bit deeper. European impact, I think, is at 110. So, but we do see a huge decline, you can see here, in inorganic supply. So they know that in Jamaica Bay, and they've, again, the same pattern of cutting the trees and this big ragweed rise, and then the drop off in the 20th century. Um, here's the heavy metals in Jamaica Bay, and again, we We've looked at the copper and the lead increases is, of course, in the industrial age, so probably starting, we think, around 1850 when you get this big um, increase. We've done this now in marshes throughout um, Long Island uh, in Connecticut, and it's amazing. What's even bigger is the copper in the Housatonic. It's just tremendous pollution in those marshes because they had brass factories in the 1800s up and down the tributaries. So this was, I won't go into details too much, but all the tie lines that we use for titanium is another indicator of just upland erosion. Um, 
This is in uh, Joko and then Yellow Bar again. So here's that same inorganic decline. And here's the lead, zinc. Um, this is 1975 when um, the lead was banned from gasoline. So we see a decline. But you do see still that there's lead in these um, top meters. We have the nitrogen. So you see this is the nitrogen increasing with Europeans uh, population increase, but we get a, a shift when there's sewage treatment going on for the isotope of nitrogen. And we're relying on these. We're learning more the more marshes we look at in terms of trying to connect the N15 in the water in the column to the nitrogen supplies upriver, the, the USGS um, nitrogen values upriver. And here's again the ragweed decline. And this charcoal is high during um, industri the industrial age, which is typical. So what we what we concluded is there's this um, huge decline. This is in the sediment, right, coming in. But the marshes seem to be in Joko and Yalabar keeping up because the organic material is increasing. And that seems to be the case in a lot of the Connecticut marshes as well, probably because of fertilizer. So the question, as we clean up the estuary, that will decline. Um, and then we'll be in worse trouble. But we still need to clean them up. So the accretion rate, and this is interesting, I think we, we need to look at this in all the marshes, is around 2 to 3 for most of the time that we're looking at millimeters per year. But in this last um, 20th century, we see a rise that it has been keeping up the sea level rise in, in Joko Marsh. Now, Cahoon looked, and I'll show you. Is it here? No, I'll come back. Because at the same time, in 2018, when our paper was published, Don Cahoon, who sets out SETs, and you know, you guys know, him, came up with the same rate for Joko that we did, which made me feel good for um, the sedimentation rate in the marsh. But it is very threatened. Um, so we have a chronology throughout history. We see what happened when Europeans came. We see the heavy metals, we see the heavy intense fertilization, and the thing is, the decisions of what happened uh, include politics as well as everything else. And that's, that when we were out there this fall, I saw the high marsh, um, Joko marsh is mostly high marsh um, vegetation, which is about this high, and in it, there was a lot of low marsh grass, which is very tall, invading. So you can actually see the vegetation changing um, as you watch. And of course, in Jamaica Bay, they've spent a lot of money, and I can't remember numbers. Is it billions, Ellen? Mm -hmm. Millions. Um, restoring restoring uh, Jamaica Bay to two or three islands with thin layer dredging and putting on top. And that has helped. Cahoon's study showed that, and I'll come back to that. But the guy who took us out, Mark Ringan there, who's a water quality guy, said he couldn't imagine how they would come up with the money to do it on a lot of the marshes. But it, at least, yeah, yeah. yeah. You mentioned the vegetation shift from low marsh, from high marsh to low marsh. Uh, is that a sign of sea level rise? Oh, yeah. Or? Yeah, yeah, sea level, yeah. And Yellow Bar has a lot of low marsh on it. We just picked the high marsh spot, the highest spot, when we did our studies. So, yeah. Dante, uh, you mentioned that marshes need inorganic as right. well as organic. Could you explain why? Well, a natural marsh, um, if it only had organic matter, and this is what's happening in Jamaica Bay a lot, will fall apart. The roots need to be grounded in mineral water. They need nutrients. They need so in in uh, Deborah Wigand also did a study in Jamaica Bay showing she X-rayed 
short course of roots and saw that with higher nutrients, they weren't producing many roots. They were wimpy roots, not holding very well. So she attributed marsh loss to just, you know, the plants having weak root structure. But it, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. And, and the reason the inorganics are, are decreasing is because of say, the hardened. Uh, right. Those, all those streams that brought sediment back in. So you have to, so the dredging works, but it's just very expensive. I was just out in um, Long Island at the, um, the it's going to make a note of Chinnacock tribe, and they, their, um, their shoreline was really just massive. It was just sandy, their, their beach. So they spent, they got a grant, they spent a lot of money, they piled up sand that's protecting their graveyards and forests. But it's a peninsula, um, it's, their land is really threatened by sea level rise on both sides. What, what, what they did was great though, they used natural materials, they used rocks, they filled up biodegradable bags of net rope bags with oyster shells and oysters. They put those out to break up waves. They they dredged and they planted marsh grass. So so far so good, right? They'll just have to keep keep doing it. I think. Yeah. Wouldn't would, would dredging also increase erosion? Um, well, they have. It depends on where you do it, you know, right? Mm -hmm. But you're right. It, that's one of the conclusions we made and, and also in Louisiana, if you dredge more channels, then the new sediment, um, when you have tidal action, it's going to fill in the deepest spot, right? Anybody who plays with mud knows that. So Grassy Bay is still in Jamaica Bay and a lot of sediment is going into that, right? So you have to, in Louisiana, they filled in a number of the channels so that then the sediment goes on top of the marsh. But it's tricky. Yeah, that's why I don't know why they're continuing to dredge in Jamaica Bay. I don't know why the navigation, they really need that. Do you know, Helen? I don't know. Because it's mainly um, recreation, right? Right. And they say there's ferries and it's like. Right. Yeah. yeah, maybe the ferry. But it doesn't have that much traffic. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so now I want to go to Piermont because we just had a paper accepted on Piermont, and there's a there's a talk there's a big meeting next next week or the next up at um, Norrie Point on all the uh, Hudson River um, aspects of the Hudson River. Piermont used to have the high marsh grass, and if any of you've never been in high marsh, it's a wonderful habitat. It has cow licks, and it's just great to walk over. And in Piermont, the maps in the 1700s were all divided up so that each, each farmer had pay for food, for uh, chinking their houses, for bedding, etc. But this, which um, used to be there, is almost gone. And it's invaded by Phragmites, the, the hybrid from Europe that has just taken over. And there's a lot of negative things about Phragmites, including uh, habitat, monoculture, loss of birds, lots of things. However, apparently it does seem to have a higher accumulation rate because it's a bigger plant to follow. However, also studies have shown that the very large rhizomes um, bring oxygen down deep and help to um, destroy the carbon that's below in the marsh. So that's one of the negative uh, things. So we cored this a long time ago. I think it was 98. Um, and we cored it down to 13 meters. It's 13 meters of peak in Piermont. We're adding up the carbon in the air. You can see the high marsh, nice grass and the frag invading. And what we saw back then and published was that we saw a big climate change in our uh, record. And now the only way to get around is to go by boat and <laughs> Phragmites is, you know, double your height. 
So you can't really get into the marsh other than hacking your way through the fed mice. This is this was a student of mine in 2005 we published, and what surprised us is that we found this huge medieval warm time in which there was tons of charcoal. The charcoal to pollen ratio was enormous. So the marsh burnt, we also saw the trees change from increases to pine and hickory to warming. And then this was the European impact again with ragweed increases and cattails. And cattails are another invasive. There is a native one, but this is the invasive one that just seemed to take over. Cattails also degrade very rapidly and don't build um, as much peat as salt marsh does. But we, we proved that this was a climate event. And then more recently, we looked at the, with the XRF, the titanium and the potassium. And we went, um, this is two meters now. This is the European impact of erosion into the marsh. So in this case, opposite from Jamaica Bay, the, all the settlement up and down the river eroded because people were farming caused sediment to come into the marsh, which increased the um, sediment supply. And then this is 20th century up here. Um, so the other thing that was interesting, when we published the paper, Piermont sits right at the location between, it's a sensitive spot near the salt plant. So as you know, the saltier water's dense, moves up the river. And the fresher the water, you get more, you get the salt front moving north and south, depending on how much water comes. And in our cores, we could see the signatures of salt, which proved during that time of the medieval warm that we had the salt wedge coming north and there was a drought. We had some reviewers at the time that said, maybe the Native Americans just burned the marsh and that's why you had charcoal. But this really proved it. And we would like to do the whole core. We, we uh, submitted a couple of proposals to do the whole 7,000 years and look at the drought record. We haven't um, gotten that funding yet. But what's interesting is there are these definite, these are the marine elements. And this is the medieval warm, where you can really get a drought frequency over those um, 7,000 years. By the way, that's Tim Penna who started out measuring it at Lamar. Um, the implications are pretty big for New York City. And we've, um, in the time period that tree rings go back, we've, our, our results agree that this area is really under threat for drought for the future with, with global warming. This is a tree ring record back to 1500. Of course, our record goes back much further. The medieval drought was between 850 to 1350. But there have been really severe droughts. And we're in a pluvial right now, as Neil Peterson's paper um, has shown us. What happens to fish in drought? This is a fish scale from um, Piermont, and we wrote a paper uh, a while ago showing that generally in our marshes, we have more inorganic matter when we have a drought, more mineral matter. And that's because when there is a drought, there's less vegetation on the landscape. So when it does rain, we get more mineral matter coming into the marsh. There's also more open water fish um, because the river stratifies and generally you have more uh, phytoplankton. You can get eutrophication very easily. Um, Bob Howarth has written a paper about that. And the droughts can cause die-off of Spartina patens, this high marsh grass, and it's a nitrogen fixer. So there are papers suggesting that's a very big negative for the future as well. And there would be big changes for the food web. We have burnt the core all the way down. And the blue is the water content in the marsh in Piermont. 
By the way, we haven't hit the bottom in this pyramid. We think it, the whole thing is sinking. Um, this is the water content. This is the medieval warm up here. So it had this much sediment coming in. But look at all of this. We don't understand how the Hudson is eroding at such different rates or Sparktail Creek. Um, you get back here and you don't have much mineral matter anymore. And the bottom date that we have for this, this only goes to 11, but there's two more maybe. The bottom is around 7,000 years ago. So there's a lot we can still learn. One other thing I should mention, I, th I think this is the same warm dry period we have in the mid-Holocene from lakes inland. So we've looked at Black Rock Forest, lots of other lakes, and we do have a time period in the past between about five and 3,000 when we have hiatuses and a lot of the lakes dry out. Mohawk and Minnewaska, if you've ever been up there, those lakes dry out during those times. So we have a history of drought, real big drought in this area. Now, coming back, this is we've only worked on the top meter for carbon, but here's this loss on ignition again. Um, and this is just the dry bulk density, the, um, the weight of the sample, the mass over volume. This is the XRF results in the top of meter of Piermont. So you have, again, the biggest one's lead. And you see the drop in 1974. Uh, we don't understand zinc. Some plants take up zinc at huge rates, like hickory. So it's hard to understand the whole zinc profile. And this is arsenic and copper. And um, again, the copper profiles are big in the top meters of the marsh. Then these are all the dates that we got for the top five meters of Piermont based on the seeds. This is the um, accelerator mass spectrometry. These are all the dates. This now, this axis is depth here, and this is calendar years. So we go back to about 2,000 years ago. We can reject these dates because they're too young, and these five, and that's probably because the tide washes in younger things at times, or roots, or something. Um, but the sedimentation rates then. The ash-free bulk density, so the, the um, you can see ranges oh, from, this is the lowest point, about 0.1 through time up to 0.15. So it's fairly constant. And the um, sed rate um, is many times as low as 2 millimeters a year, and the highest is about 4. And this is the uncertainty. What you always see towards the top is this big increase, which is probably plant material not degrading. Um, we, there's a new paper out, Christine, on that for, for peatlands, and it's the same thing. It's just you don't have compaction and, and recent uh, deposition. So the net is not really in balance yet. Um, this is that same. Um, Holland record showing climate change, so this is the, the drought here. But we also had a little bit of a medieval, I mean, a little ice age signal in here with more spruce and colder species. And then we have, of course, European settlement. And so when you superimpose those, and we used, again, some of these markers, the heavy metals and uh, the percent and sewage treatment really kicking in here in the watershed near Piermont in 1968. And then you calculate the carbon flux and the mineral flux. So again, um, coming from the past towards the present now, you can see that we had a higher um, carbon flux and mineral flux back um, before the thousand years ago. And then the last thousand years, it's been pretty low in both cases with this recent increase. But um, when we think back about sedimentation rates, that's pretty low. And I want to compare it to some of the other um, work that's been done for the Hudson. 
And just to show you, some of the um, Hudson River painters shows what it was like, how much carbon was being taken off, if you think about it that way, with hay. And that's what we think we see here. Um, we think here in the medieval warm, we think carbon was low because it's burning off, right? Here we think it's in the little ice age, it's pretty low because it's cold and the growing season was short, so you didn't have as much time for the plants. But we also have an European impact of taking all this carbon off, and that extends back into part of the little life stage as well. Um, so we think those are all contributing um, to the carbon, to the lower carbon. Um, now I wanted to show Cahoon's data uh, here. He had local relative sea level rise at four millimeters per year, Olivia, over this period mm -hmm. from New Jersey. And then he got a, a rate uh, of 5.9, coincident with the SEP record. And the tidal range is pretty big in Jamaica Bay. So that was his figure. Um, and these are, I thought you might enjoy this big egg restoration. Here's the dredge throwing the sediment up from the channel. Here's the restored uh, marsh. And then they planted by hand. And marshes can recover pretty fast. Um, and finally, this, have any of you, you probably read Kabat, Nava Kabat's paper on the Hudson Estuary. They used low, medium, and high um, accretion rates and then did all these projections for what the Hudson would be like with sea level rise. And they used a, a medium sea level rise and a high sea level rise. But when you look at our long-term range, I mean, most of the marshes we've poured up and down the Hudson are about um, they're all 7,000 years old at the bottom, and they range from about 9 meters to Piermont, which is an anomaly, and we think it's sinking. So if you just do the math, you get, um, well, close to um, 1.4, I think is about the highest if you don't include Piermont. And they used rates that were generally much higher. This is just the time that Piermont had that was higher, but but the average is is much much lower. So we're in much bigger danger than I think what their paper suggested for the future. And of course we're going to get more drought. Well, here the projections are I think for um, increased rainfall, certainly more storm frequency and intensity, which will erode. Um, and then the sea level rise, it's really, I think, inevitable unless we spend a fortune for Jamaica Bay and for a lot of the marshes and even Long Island. Um, also, recently the administration's, you know, removed the uh, protections for small wetlands and anything that's not connected to something big. So um, it's not a it's not a pretty picture for the future. On the other hand, the Shinnecock uh, restoration gave me hope because I think if people work, they can keep their marshes, um, depending, of course, on the rate. The other thing people can do, I think, is is dam removal because in the old days, you think about all those dams and all um, that were here. If you've never been to the Croton Dam, go up there and look at it. It's absolutely amazing. It's huge. It's right across the river from, well, a little bit south of Bear Mountain, so it's not far. It was built at the turn of the century. Um, but this is the picture of dams in the Hudson watershed. So there are lots of reasons to open up dams like they've done on the West Coast. And um, for fisheries and eels and many other reasons. But there are also a sediment supply that we could use for the future. And I guess that's it. Thanks.
Oh, people, most of them are, a lot of them, private property, right? They don't, Sparkdale, right by Lamont, they don't want their pond to be gone. They'd rather have a pond. But there's also.